Hello, and a very pleasant good morning to you wherever you may be. Thank you so much for tuning in to Discovery Fellowship Church Online. As you probably know, we're also meeting live and in person for our worship services each Sunday morning at 9 and 1030 out on the East Lawn at Discovery. Now, you're probably tired of us talking about it all the time, but we highly recommend you download the Church Center app. It is a fast and easy way to stay connected, view groups, uh, give online, and also the easiest way to check in so that we know you were here this morning. And rather than me just kind of talk about it, why don't you watch a short clip of how to check in through the Church Center app. Our youth group, Discovery Student Ministries, meets every Wednesday night at Fossil Creek Park for live and in-person youth group. We meet from 6.30 to 8. We're also producing a lot of online content as well, so make sure you follow us on social media. If there's ever inclement weather that might hinder us meeting together on a Wednesday night, um, then we'll post it there first. And as always, if you need anything, have any questions, want us to pray for you, just ask. Good morning, Discovery family. We're so glad you're here today. So great to see you all out here. We are, love getting back together again, and we're excited to be able to do that. So as we begin our worship time, let's just take a moment and pray and thank the Lord for his provision. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunities we have to come and worship you in this beautiful weather, in this beautiful place of Colorado. And here in Fort Collins, Lord, we thank you for your protection for our families. We thank you for protection for um, our country. We uh, again ask that you uh, uh, get this virus over with so we can come back together. And we thank you for this time and bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing. Oh, 
Thank you. Shall pierce the night 
and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face oh praise the name of the Lord of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand, oh, 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 oh.
I'll stand here in the power of Christ. I'll stand. Thank you for singing. You may be seated. Good morning. I think this is actually a first for me. I've never been on TV before. I don't have my own YouTube channel. Probably the closest thing is those eight millimeter movies my parents took of me when I was um, a little kid back in the 60s. Now, was it Ernie Kovacs? And if you know who that was, you're definitely older than I am. Or Mr. Rogers, who said, thank you for inviting me into your living room. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you did invite us into your living room and tuned us in, as it were. Jesus said, wherever two or more are gathered in his name, there he is in his midst. For those watching remotely this morning, you and I make two. My prayer is that his presence would be a source of both peace and joy for all of us, no matter where we are this morning. Now, I'd like to start off by asking everybody a question. If I said, happy Juneteenth, who knows what I'm talking about? Raise of hands. If you missed the media blitz, Juneteenth is short for June 19th. On that day in 1865, Major General Gordon Granger told the slaves in Texas that they were free. That was almost two years after Abraham Lincoln issued his executive order, the one that we know as the Emancipation Proclamation. It was interesting that that order applied only to the secessionist Confederate states. Elsewhere, it was still legal to own slaves. It wasn't until six months after Juneteenth in December of 1865 that the 13th Amendment to our Constitution was ratified and slavery was abolished across the whole nation. Now, in light of the police shootings and the protests, Juneteenth has gotten a lot more attention and publicity in these recent days. And I couldn't help but noticing the plethora of articles about it. And here's a sampling. Here's pop singer Taylor Swift, and she's called for June 19th to be a national holiday. She released a video explaining why that is and the history of it and gave her staff the day off. Then there's Elvita King. She's the niece of Dr. Martin Luther King. She celebrated Juneteenth by making public appearances all across the state of Maryland. And King stands out for many of the other Juneteenth celebrants as a Christian who says that despite ending slavery, that, quote, there's still a class of people who are not free. That's the babies in the womb. And here's Ben Carson, our nation's HUD secretary. Mr. Carson said, I think to commemorate the emancipation of slaves is a wonderful thing, providing freedom in our country, but also celebrating the hundreds of thousands of people who are of multiple different ethnicities who gave their lives in order that we could achieve that freedom in this country is a very significant, important step. Both the Republicans and the Democrats were going to be introducing bills to make Juneteenth a federal holiday. And it's become a rallying point. For some, it's an opportunity to press their own particular political agenda. For others, an excuse for more violent protests. But for others, it's a time to remember the past, to celebrate current freedoms, and to express hope for future changes. We have many days of remembrance here in the United States. There's things like Memorial Day, or Martin Luther King Day, or July 4th, or 9-11, which isn't an actual national holiday, but that date lives on. It's similar to, say, December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day, a date that will live in infamy, as FDR said. And soon, June 19th, or Juneteenth, will be on that list. Some of you may have personal days of remembrance. Donna will sometimes say to me, do you know what today is? My heart skips a beat. Am I in trouble? Am I forgetting a birthday or anniversary? And then she says, my mom would have been 80 years old today. It's a day of remembering her mother. And I say, oh yeah, and I breathe a sigh of relief. There's lots of days of remembrance in scripture. There's the feast of Passover 
or Atonement, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. And there aren't just days of remembrance, but symbols of remembrance. You may be familiar with the term, the Ebenezer Stone. That was a stone placed in a visible location for all to see. It was remembrance for the people, for God helping the Israelites win a battle over the Philistines. And Ebenezer means stone of help. Similarly, we have our own memorial symbols. There's the Pearl Harbor Memorial. Many of you have likely been there. It's one of my own personal favorites. Or the 9-11 Memorial and the Associated Museum, moving for many people. And there's many others. But this morning, I want to look at a passage about memorial holidays in the Old Testament book of Zechariah. And I think it will provide some guidance to questions that many of us have, like, how do we respond in the light of the pandemics, the riots, the injustice on all sides, and the uncertain outlook on so many fronts? Before we read the text, I want to give some historical background to set the context. This particular passage was written to the Jews, and the promises in the passage are specific to Israel as a nation. But having acknowledged that, there are principles and truths and a message of hope that applies to all of us today. Now, if you recall, the people of Israel, the whole southern part of that nation, were taken hostage. They were rounded up and marched off to Babylon. God orchestrated that because of their rejection of him, a consequence of embracing the false pagan religions that were around them. And he sent prophet after prophet, warning them to worship only him, to follow him. But they ignored, mistreated, and even tried to kill many of those messengers. So they ended up as a nation in exile. But then, right on cue, according to God's timetable, 70 years later, the Persians achieved military victory over the Babylonians. And the Persian ruler Cyrus said God gave him a message that the Jews could go back to their land and rebuild their cities, their homes, and the temple. And so the people did return to Israel. But there were difficulties. There was organized opposition to their building projects. And depending on the shifting political landscape of the day, that rebuilding was an on again, off again affair. When they were working, the work was often slow. The temple wasn't going to be as big or impressive. It was much scaled back from the first one. And some said it wasn't even worth it. At times, they just wanted to give up. Now, Zechariah encouraged the people to persevere in these challenging times reminding them that God was with them, was on their side, and if they would trust God, that he would give them success. And they did press on, and the temple was eventually completed. And it was around that time that a number of questions surfaced about some holidays they had been keeping. The past century or so had been a difficult time for them. They didn't voluntarily get up and march off to Babylon. They had actually resisted. Jerusalem had been under siege for about two years. There were food shortages. Scripture mentions cannibalism. Many people died during that time. And eventually, when the walls were breached, the city and the temple were burned to the ground. Everything was razed. Then, while in Babylon, they were slaves in a strange land. Special times like weddings and births were not at all like they were back at home. There were no family trips down to the Jordan River, no summer camps, no school proms, and we can identify with many of those things and the feelings that associated accompany them. Those events were ingrained into the cultural ethos of their, of their community, so much so that they had established a number of holidays remembering days of fasting, of mourning over those hard times of those years. And those holidays were named simply by the month of the event when it happened. We remember September 11th or July 4th. They had the 10th of Tibet. That was when the king of Babylon first came and laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. Then they had the 9th of Tammuz. That was the day the city walls were breached. Then there was the 9th of Av. That was when the temple was destroyed by fire. Or the 3rd of Tishri. That was when their governor, Gedalia, was assassinated. They were asking, now that these things are better, those times have passed, the temple's about done, there's no wars happening, should we keep on observing these special days? And God gives them an answer. Well, sort of. But before we read and dive into the text, let's take a moment and, and just pray and ask God to guide our time. Father God, we thank you for your words, ancient words of truth that speak to us even today, for they are indeed words of life and truth. 
Take them and use them for your purposes, Lord, to your glory. And may we be doers and not just hearers of them. In Christ's name we ask you. Amen. So let's go ahead and read together um, chapter 7 of Zechariah. It'll be up there on the screens for you. Follow along in your own Bible if you have one. In the fourth year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month with this chislev. Now the people of Bethel had sent Sherezer and Regum Melech and their men to entreat the favor of the Lord, saying to the priests of the house of the Lord, of the hosts and of the prophets, should I weep and abstain in the fifth month, as I have done for so many years? Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, say to all the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth month and in the seventh, for these 70 years, was it for me you fasted? And when you eat and when you drink, do you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Were not these the words that the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and prosperous, with her cities around her and the south and the lowland were inhabited? And the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one another, do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor, and let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. But they refused to pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears that they might not hear. They made their hearts diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words that the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Therefore, great anger came from the Lord of hosts. As I called and they would not hear, so they called, and I would not hear, says the Lord of hosts, and I scattered them with a whirlwind among the nations that they had not known. Thus the land they left was desolate, so that no one went to and fro, and the pleasant land was made desolate. The word of the Lord. The first observation I have is that they actually started by seeking God's favor. They wanted to know what God thought about their question. Should we keep on observing those special holidays, those fasting times? And that's exactly the right place to start for any of our decisions. We should be asking, what might God have to say about it? And the Bible talks a lot about that, seeking God in our daily affairs. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 is uh, a verse that sums it up as, as good as anyone in Scripture that says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Now, when we think and we act in line with God's direction and with His guidelines, that's both wise and good. And there's a reasonable, but not guaranteed, hope that God's favor and blessing will accompany that. As we make decisions about what to do in these uncertain times, we need to start by seeking God, testing and aligning our thinking with his word. And in these verses, the people certainly appeared to be approaching their question rightly. They sent a group of representatives to the priests and prophets to get God's input about their fasting question. So what was the answer that they got? Probably not what they expected. God did answer. Verse 4 says, The word of the Lord of hosts came to me. But it's interesting. He didn't answer their specific question. Not yet, anyway. Instead, God challenges them to check their hearts and their motives. He asked them a question. Look at what God says in verse 5. This is from the New Living Translation. During those 70 years of exile, when you fasted and mourned in the summer and in the autumn, talking about two of those holidays, was it really for me that you were fasting? And even now in your holy festivals, aren't you eating and drinking just to please yourselves? Here they're saying, Lord, we're seeking you. Should we continue to observe those special holy days of remembrance? And God says basically, give me a break. You guys are just fooling yourselves. Those fasts, they were just for show. Really, pretty much a big pity party. If you're going to fast, then actually fast. Don't make it about yourselves. Now, there's a bunch of reasons that you might want to fast. To seek guidance. To express grief, which is what they were doing. To overcome temptations, just to name a few. But in all of them, the purpose is to take our eyes off of the things of the world and to focus our eyes and our hearts completely on God. Their focus was backwards on themselves and the, problem, the problems of this world. We too have trials, especially now. Some have lost jobs, 
Others have family or friends who are sick with COVID or maybe know someone who has actually um, died, passed away from the disease. And then on a different level, but equally disheartening, uh, most of us are stuck at home, unable to see friends. There's weddings and graduations and birthdays that have been delayed or completely canceled. Sporting events, plays and concerts, all canceled. And it's been months since we've been able to catch dinner and a movie out somewhere. What motivates our prayers as we seek God in the midst of these circumstances? Is it only about us? About how much we're missing our favorite team? Or is it about taking our eyes off of the world and putting them on to the things of God? God goes on to say in these passages, what about your feasts? Apparently there was some time of organized celebration that was happening as well, maybe for the completion of the temple. We don't know, we're not told. But he points out that those two are just about having a good time. He says, you have celebrations in my name and leave me completely out of them. And then in verse seven, God levies another pointed accusation against them. He says, you guys are no different than your parents and your grandparents who were sent to Babylon. They were just going through the motions, paying lip service, playing at church, and you are doing the exact same thing. You know, it's easy to deceive ourselves. If we think of some of our own national holidays like Veterans Day or Memorial Day, what do we do on those holidays? For some, they have great meaning, especially if you've lost a family member in an armed conflict. But for most of the population, it's just another day off, a time to camp, picnic, have fun. And if we're honest, not many of us truly honor Memorial Day. Or think about that holiday that happens on December 25th. Most of us look forward to that day. And if you're like me, you savor the friends, the food, the family, the festivities. And I wonder what God's response would be if we sent a delegation asking, should we continue to celebrate Christmas? I can see the response being, let me ask you a question. Answer me this. Is it really for me that you're celebrating December 25th? Now, a positive example in the right way to celebrate is looking at how Lynn and Michael McHugh remember Lynn's son, Gavin Hageman. Gavin attended here, and while a college student, his life was tragically cut short. On the first year anniversary of Gavin's death, they hosted a time of remembrance. And there was no doubt the focus was on Gavin. It was a time to remember his life. It wasn't an excuse to get together with friends, even though there were lots of friends there. It wasn't a time to get together and feast and eat, even though there was food there. There were activities to guide us through remembering Gavin. One activity was to paint a rock. You can see it there on the screen with something that reminded you of Gavin. And here it is physically, my rock. And sure enough, every time I look at it, I'm reminded about Gavin. There was also a time of prayer to thank God for the time we did have with Gavin here and to ask God to ease the ache in all of our hearts and to petition God that other young lives would not be cut short. You could have attended that event without ever having met Gavin. You could have mingled with the people, eaten some food, painted a rock, and you probably would have had a pretty good time, but you probably wouldn't have been there for Gavin. It would have been more for your benefit than anything. It's really about a relationship. You needed to have known Gavin to rightly do justice to an event to honor Gavin. When we say we're focused on God at church, in our personal prayer times, during a time of fasting, during times of trouble, a special holiday, we need to check and see where our focus is. Is it about God or is it about something else? And then that begs the question, what is your relationship with God? Do you actually know him? Do you have a relationship with him? So do you? Some might be asking, so how do you have a relationship with God? And if that's the question in your mind, I'd say, let me introduce you to Jesus. Because the Bible says that Jesus is the exact representation of God. In fact, Jesus is God in human form. You wanna know God, get to know Jesus. The whole Bible, this book of Zechariah, is all about Jesus. And if you want to know him and you don't, ask any church staff, myself, or the Christians sitting next to you. We'd love to make you that introduction. Let's see what God tells the people next about their special fast days, and we'll see how to respond rightly. God speaks again and is saying, let me tell you what a fast day, a special day, 
in honor of me and my memory should look like. Look at verses 9 and 10 in Zechariah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor, and let none of you devise evil against one another in your heart. If you heard Pastor Rick's message two weeks ago, those words are familiar. They echo God's words in Micah 6, 8. If you missed that message, go listen to it. It's available online. It'll be well worth your time. I won't try and restate what Rick said, but I do have a couple of observations. Given all the racial injustice that's so much in the news, I want to acknowledge the reality of that. We have a number of friends who are in a mixed race marriage. One of them went to a social venue here in Fort Collins not that long ago. The black spouse had some friends along who were also black. The establishment said that the black contingent were known troublemakers and would not be allowed in. And that was completely false. I don't think most of them had even ever been there before. Only the white contingent was welcome, even though the husband and wife were a married couple, obviously. This isn't Alabama, this is Colorado. We could go out calling out injustices for a long time, not just racial injustices, but all kinds. In the light of all of that, God says, you wanna hold a special day, do it in my name, then do something about injustice. Show kindness and compassion for someone else. Make my priorities your priorities. Take the focus off of yourself. Listen to these words from Isaiah 58 on what it means to fast. This is from the New Living Translation. They won't be up on the screen, so just listen as I read through these. Shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Shout aloud. Don't be timid. Tell my people Israel of their sins. They act so pious. They come to the temple every day and they seem delighted to learn all about me. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves and you don't even notice it. I'll tell you why, I respond. It's because you're fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds in the wind. You dress up in burlap, cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this is what will please the Lord? No, this is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Listen, lighten, excuse me, the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. There is one for some of us. Then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call, the Lord will answer. Yes, I am here, he will quickly reply. Challenging words for all of us. When was the last time you and I actually fasted like God wants us to fast? As much as God is a God of love and mercy, he is also a God of justice. He gives them and us a warning. He's serious about what he says, and that warning is not to be ignored. We don't like to think, though, think about those things much. We want a God who is more like the doting grandparent, who will give us sweets every time we visit and let us get away with just about anything. David Hawking was the Bible teacher on the Biola Hour radio show uh, a couple of decades ago, and he said this, the great presumption among believers is that we will never face the consequences of our actions. We erroneously believe that somehow we can cover up what is going on in secret places and never face the judgment of God. However, God indicates that when we are not right with him, our worship is already ineffectual. Not only do we try and cover up our disobedience, verse 11 of our text says that they refused to pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped up their ears that they might not hear. They made their hearts diamond hard lest they should hear the law and the words that the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. God's saying, don't do what your ancestors did. Don't ignore me. Don't plug your ears, blah, blah, blah. Don't turn your back on me and reject what I'm saying. 
We've all done that to our parents, to our spouse, turned our back, stopped listening, walked away. It's worse than stupid when we do that when it's God's word. These people were at an inflection point. They were asking, hey God, what should we do about these holidays that we've been keeping? We ask similar questions today. Hey God, what do you want me to do in light of these crises that we're facing? Should we fast? Should we have midweek prayer meetings? Maybe I should join a protest march. Maybe we should establish special days of remembrance. And God says to them and to us, start by seeking me. Then evaluate your hearts. See if you're focused on yourselves or on God. And then respond rightly. Spend your energies to spending justice, showing kindness to each other, taking care of the needy. That is how you honor me, says God. So what about us? Are we listening to what God is saying? Are we telling God what our needs are, what we want him to do, what's important for us? And after we do listen and know what God wants, are we gonna respond rightly and actually do what he says? That's the message in chapter seven. That's how God answered their question. But he has more to say yet in chapter eight. Now we don't have enough time um, to go look at that whole chapter, but I'm gonna take a peek at a couple key verses but you should go home and read the whole chapter and see if what I'm saying is actually there. In chapter eight, the tone changes. There's an amazing message of hope, a promise of what things will be like in the future. God says things will get better, much, much better. And if you read through chapter eight, you'll discover the phrase, I will, or thus says the Lord, almost a dozen times, God himself is going to do something. And these prophecies, these promises, they're specific to Israel in this context, but there are similar prophecies and promises in scripture for us Gentile followers of Messiah. In the interest of time, I'm not going to try and connect the dots between this passage and the other ones, but notice with me what God says he will do. In verse three, it says, I will return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. There's going to be a new Jerusalem where God is with his people in our very midst. In verse four, it talks about old men and women sitting in the streets, streets filled with playing boys and girls. It's a picture of God providing peace and security. Everyone lives to a ripe old age. There's no COVID-19 cutting things short. Verse seven says, I'm going to save my people from the land of the east and from the west. Here is a promise of gathering, of protection, of deliverance from enemies. For Israel, salvation in a national sense. And then in verse 13, again, he says, I will save you. There may be a bit more of a spiritual, eternal sense. You know, the book of Zechariah is filled with details of the saving Messiah. It talks about one who is both priest and king, about one who arrives riding on a donkey, about one whose life is cut short, that was valued at 30 pieces of silver and the silver thrown into a potter's field. This describes to a T, Jesus. So God tells the people that are fasting about all the things he's going to do and says that all these difficult times will soon at some point be ancient history. And in the light of all that, what are the people supposed to do? Keep fasting? Let's look at verses 16 and 17 of chapter eight. They say, these are the things that you shall do. Speak truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. And do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. And love no false oath, for all these things I hate, declares the Lord. Deja vu. God reiterates what he said in chapter 7. As you wait for God to set things right, care about the things he cares about. Do the things he would do. In Second Peter chapter 3, verse 11, it talks about how people should be living in ec expectation and anticipation of Jesus' return. And it says, in light of what God is going to do, quote, what kind of people ought you be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. It's the same message there again. And finally, we get a burst of thunder and a somewhat direct answer to the question, should we fast? Let's look at verse 18 and 19 in Zechariah 8. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the 10th, and you all know what those are now, those four holidays. 
shall be to the house of Judah, seasons of joy and gladness and cheerful fast. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. So there is coming a time when all those fasting days of remembering hard times, Memorial Days, Gavin Hagman Day, Juneteenth Day, COVID 19th Day, will all be turned into days of rejoicing, days of joyous celebration. All those promised blessings of turning sorrow into joy, they are experienced in part now as believers in Jesus and in full in a time yet to come. Those blessings are the inheritance of those God calls his children through faith in Christ Jesus, be you Jew or Gentile. You know, there's great clarity throughout scripture what God wants us to be about. Now, a cautionary note, this is not a call to political activism. Politics and regime change is not what's being called for here. Jesus was all about God's work and not once did he call his followers to gather under a political banner. Quite the opposite, the rally call was under the banner of God. What's needed is heart change. And the only one who changes hearts is God. And the only means whereby that happens is by being born again. And the only way that that happens is by coming to know Jesus as your savior. The greatest kindness we can show to someone is by telling them about Jesus and the message of free salvation for them. So the challenge for all of us in our own cultural times of trouble is to ask God how we might respond rightly. You're not sure how you can serve? There's lots of ministries within our church, those who make and take meals to people in our fellowship. There's the deacons who help in so many ways behind the scenes, the Shine Ministry distributing supplies to families in need in our community, or many of you are involved just one-on-one -on -one with family, friends, and neighbors. Maybe some of you are in a season where you're overwhelmed by serving as a single parent or a caregiver for family members with tough health issues. Wherever we find ourselves, that same God-focused heart attitude ought to be present. As we go away from here, it's all too easy, and I know I speak from experience, to leave with good intentions. As a clothing thought, I leave you with this poem. Numerous speakers have quoted it, and I like it because, first of all, it's a poem I can understand. Let's say poetry isn't a strength of mine. And more importantly, because it's memorable and poignant. It's called Tomorrow by Edgar Albert Guest. He was going to be all that a mortal should be tomorrow. No one should be kinder or braver than he tomorrow. A friend who was troubled and weary he knew, who'd be glad of a lift and who needed it too, on him he would call and see what he could do tomorrow. Each morning he stacked up the letters he'd write tomorrow and thought of the folks he would fill with delight tomorrow. It was too bad indeed. He was busy today. He hadn't a moment to stop on his way. More time we, he would have to give others, he'd say, tomorrow. The greatest of workers this man would have been, tomorrow. The world would have known him if ever he'd seen, tomorrow. But the fact is he died and he faded from view. And all he left here when living was through was a mountain of things he intended to do, tomorrow. Let's close with prayer. After the thunder. Does the thunder pick, does this pick up the thunder? Mm -hmm. okay. Father God, indeed, help us to be doers and not just hearers of your word. Father, thank you for the words, the challenge. Lord, you want us to be followers of Christ, to do things that he would do, to um, be conformed to his image. Father, help us to not to have a, a selfish, self-centered attitude. In these times, Lord, help us to be focused on you, to be your representatives, your ambassadors, your witness to those around us. And we want to do all of this to the glory of your name. And it's in the name of your son, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us online, Discovery Fellowship Church. We're going to move into our last closing song. Feel free at this time to check in using the Church Center app. Uh, you can also give online through the app or through our website. Of course, you can always mail it in. Um, thanks again for joining us. Uh, let's go out on this high energy note this morning. When I think about your goodness, my heart is overwhelmed. How can I begin to thank you for everything you've done?
Come on. Thank you. 